on the very outset i would like to thank uh, once again stefan for this wonderful opportunity uh, if uh, in in person i could have attended it would have been my second mof conference and second visit to dresden but uh, hopefully it will happen sometimes in future so i shall today uh, will uh, will try to speak or talk a little bit on a different note uh, or something on a uh, relevant or a topic in a different uh, from a different perspective but i'll start uh, start my talk from a different outline that this is not a, a either mock or cough uh, slide this is slide on a graphene oxide where uh, this gentleman and their group has nicely described that you could take these two dimensional material and eventually construct different kind of morphologies or different kind of structures or or uh, mesoscopic structure each time you construct something like that the although the basic backbone is the 2d graphene oxide but the eventual material could be 2d 0d and 3d and so on and so forth and then you have an opportunity to you know and research or look up the, into a diverse type of uh, applications looking at at it if we if think a little bit carefully we do have a similar material Uh, with us uh, this is the covalent organic framework the 2d materials 2d layer structures and these 2d layer structures also could be on that same note uh, in a equivalent manner could be converted into different morphologies as well like what this graphene oxide uh, paper we have seen similar thing you can see in, in graphene as well so we have an opportunity to tune these 2d materials which is crystalline and porous in nature into these diverse morphologies not only that we could also interconnect them we could move from one to another and uh, try to use this pathway to create even a better material for some industrial applications so that sort of my uh, objective was uh, for last few years to look into this uh, morphological variation or morphological modulation the reason we wanted to do something like that is is because that if we could if we are successful in doing something of that sort we have a diverse a variety of functionalities that we have already seen in betina stock and uh, and also you know in other publications as well so we will have a diverse variety in terms of the 3d or the 2d architecture and internal uh, modulations of the properties as well in terms of functionalities so we have a huge library in our hand or we will create a huge library or create a new dimension in this library so as we had already discussed uh, during the talk and the qa session that these materials are generally stacked up uh, layered structures but when we try to make it into a bulk scale or in in a, in a much more facile manner into the laboratory we often end up into getting these amorphous uh, framework structures which is uh, which in general we uh, face difficulty into properties not only that they are fairly chemically unstable and then that also compromises the overall usage of this material however we could sort out uh, this that problem a few years ago and we could make this very high I mean, extensively chemically stable skito enamine based covalent organic structure and i'm pleased to say that you know i have seen a uh, multiple probably i don't know probably 4 to 500 publications on this theme by diverse audience all over the world so which gives us a lot of pleasure and satisfaction as as well on that note uh, you know if you uh, the drawback of those uh, materials or the or the synthesis of this covalent organic framework is if you need to make it in bulk when i talk about the bulk we talk about like a half a kilogram uh, bulk Uh, those kind of things then uh, the method we use commonly in our lab that is the freeze pump thaw uh, i'm not going into the in detail of these uh, of the synthesis procedure but this freeze pump thaw cycle gives you on the uh, milligram scale compound and and also they are you know difficult to mold you need a very inert high vacuum condition you have to flame seal it and you have to break the seal you know it it's 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 not really industrially viable slash feasible so once again uh, you know with a lot of pleasure i could also say that we could sort out that problem as well 
uh, using the sparatolo in sulfonic acid based uh, synthesis of these soft materials in our laboratory. And uh, now my colleagues at National Chemical Laboratory is using these and uh, making uh, almost half a kilogram of material of covalent organic framework, you know, uh, for the Gas Authority of India Limited. But that being said, that being said, uh, we always felt during our synthesis, and I am a crystallographer by training, that when these layers are, are assembled, like uh, once again, as, as Bettina gave a very nice, uh, uh, very nice viewpoint, that they are not fully stacked, either eclipsed or staggered. Mostly they have a disorder in terms of eclipsed network. If we give a mild force, then they will probably exfoliate because of the force and you eventually create exactly a similar material like you did from graphite or shearing the graphite, which is graphene. So you can create from COPS or covalent organic frameworks, a nano sheets or nano structured covalent organic frameworks we that time called as covalent organic nano sheets. You may counter argue that, you know, well, since these materials are pi pi stack, what is the point of uh, so many things? If I just uh, do a simple sonication, I should be able to make uh, such nano sheets as well. Yes, you can. Most certainly you can. Other than mechanochemical synthesis, with the sonication also, you could make these covalent organic nano sheets. However, in both the cases, the challenges are that these materials are not homogeneous, which I, what I try to mean over here is that these materials, you know, you could make some stacks which are 50 layers, you could make some stacks which are five layers, and you could make some stacks which are 500 layers. So you have absolutely no control whatsoever in terms of the mechanical synthesis and the homogeneity of your product. So that was sort of a drawback or or a very overwhelming drawback which popped up as soon as we started this, uh, this work. Needless to say, we still wanted to take a look whether we can really make these 2D materials or make these exfoliate these 2D materials into two dimensional sheets structure. And we did uh, went ahead and made uh, such uh, materials uh, in the laboratory. And as you can see, these bulky powdered or, or sort of something like, you know, when the newspapers come in our house in the rolled up manner and you remove that rubber band and then open the newspaper. So sort of like that. So these things flatten up and it gives you this layered structure. We did, of course, the solid state NMR, IR and porosity and other studies to figure out that we do have the local structure, but due to, and also to some extent, crystallinity is not too much. So we could, we could look into that, however, However, that, that does not solve the problem. It's still lots of stacks and lots of stacked layers one after another. So we thought that let us try to restructure the whole thing and try to uh, sort of break it uh, from the code itself, sort of like a bottom-up synthesis. So we took simple this guanidium trianine and reacted with salicylaldehyde. It's a very simple, very simple reaction. You can make it very easily. You do a reflux and you crystallize it. You get the single crystal structure, and you and we figured out that this this guanidium amine because of this uh, you know, chloride, bromide, or iodide, which is the salt, these anions remain stacked up or or sort of interdigitate within the stacks and give the stacks or pushes the stacks a little bit away from each other. We thought that if we take this as an opportunity and and instead of uh, salicylaldehyde, react it with this fluorogusinol trialdehyde and use the same ketoenol tautomerism principle, we should be able to make a covalent organic framework where the layers are far apart from each other. Now, if that is the case, then if we disperse it into, let's say, water or any other solvent and give a mild sonication, if you wish, you should be able to peel off these layers just like that because they're internally very labile or internally they're trying to sort of uh, dislocate or dislodge, dislodge from, from each other. Now, coming back to it, we synthesized, as I told you, and uh, to my surprise, I, I, to be very honest, was a bit skeptical. And I figured out that we figured out that with a very, you know, I would say very primitive or, or not so a sophisticated TEM technique, we could still even to see that all these things just like that peel off or separate out as soon as we disperse it into, into water. You don't even need to sonicate. And 
we did uh, uh, AFM study uh, uh, of a reasonably thicker, or, or, or we try to code, drop cast it on a, on a AFM grid and do it, uh, do this process. Once again, I thought that it will still stack back, but it didn't. And we could figure out that you could make layers of errors as around two nanometer to five nanometer dispersion. It's still not very precise. You still have this, uh, this uh, error of around two to four nanometers uh, here and there. But I would say that uh, these were pretty satisfactory to see that they could dislocate so nicely, even with a mild, very mild force. These materials, when we coated on a very simple polymer support, showed a very nice antimicrobial and antibacterial property, which due to lack of time, I went from going. Now coming back to it, uh, once again, we did uh, post-synthetic modification uh, by mechanical delamination or sonic addition. We did pre-synthetic modification by uh, pushing one uh, chloride or halide anion inside. You could even, if you don't like either of those, you could even go for one more round of post-synthetic modification where you could put some hydroxy functionalities into the covalent organic framework structure and you could take that up and react it uh, and, and exfoliate it by doing a post-synthetic modification, which we did, but just by simple chelylation or this simple post-synthetic modification of this amine crafting. So this was also another way of just uh, slashing it out, like you, know, you, you chop off one, one layer from this uh, graphite layer to get the graphene. So you can similarly do the same stuff with this covalent organic framework as well if you don't like either of the mechanochemical or the pre-synthetic uh, modification. So with this, we, I hope I could give a background that you could make these materials into different, uh, I put in, in the nano sheet manner. And we often thought if that's so, then how these uh, fellows or the, how these nano sheets or assemblies, they assemble, they self-assemble, or do they at all self-assemble? They're like a dead or rigid uh, material which does nothing once you synthesize. So on that note, that was our, our curiosity because we often used to see different, different morphologies and we had no idea. I, I'm a crystallographer by training. I could always relate the morph morphologies uh, with respect to their crystal structure because the faces are very nicely organized. Here, I had always had a difficulty to do something of that sort. So keeping that in perspective, what we uh, decided that all right, okay, what we do is we choose we chose a simple covalent organic structure which has a very nice intramolecular hydrogen bonding and this bonding gave a very nice stability to this structure but that was not uh, the objective the objective or during the course of the synthesis we figured out that these materials crystallize like this nice tiny nanoparticles as you can see very nice tiny nanoparticles but if you leave these nanoparticles into solution they sort of self-assemble with each other and eventually form this hollow structure where the central code is completely hollow and the outer code is nothing but the assembly of this nanoparticle. So it's like as if these materials are alive and they can actually think and organize themselves into different, different dimensions. So from a very tiny nanoparticle, you create a large, uh, I mean, I would say, I would not say zero dimensional, although it looks like a very nice, zero dimensional architecture. So the mechanistic way we uh, just analyzed. So these cross layers uh, form these nice nanoparticles. They assemble together, they form this haphazard uh, network, network. And then, and then these networks, once again assemble, fuse among themselves like Oswald ripening, which finish at the end of the day by making this nice hollow spherical structure. So you can see these hollow spherical structures, they're very high, you know, they're extremely porous, these uh, uh, hollow spherical structures, exactly like the nanoparticles when we synthesize. So there is absolutely no change in porosity. In fact, there is a very little change in crystallinity as well. So all these cases we could see these particles, they don't change their internal structure, but overall they give you a very nice morphological modulation from starting point to the finish line. So that gave, made us a little bit curious that if these layers stack like this and eventually they form this spherical structure, can we really take it up uh, one notch higher? That can we synthesize a diverse variety of such spherical particles? And can we 
also try to tune them up on like a garland or a pearl necklace that we often see in India if you, if you go to a nice jewelry shop. So my student, Himadri, uh, who is just finishing up, he synthesized a bunch of these, uh, uh, these spheres. These are not hollow, they are filled spheres, the covalent organic nanospheres. They are of different dimensions, starting from 50 nanometer to almost close to half a micron. And the synthesis is fairly easy. You just take these ingredients and then, I mean, uh, about uh, 15, 16 years ago, when I was a postdoc with in uh, Omar Yagi's group, when we, I saw that my colleagues are making these cough materials you know, day in, day out, putting this freeze pump thaw. I mean, I would have never thought that it will come down to this level. When you just take the simple ingredients, A and reactant aldehyde and amine, and you put it into a DCM layer, give it some time, do a little bit of stirring, and you make this nanosphere. So that's not all. The interesting thing what we found out is that when you take this DCM layer and add a little bit of water on top of it, due to pure surface tension, this nanosphere starts going towards the bilayer. And, and these nanospheres initially, which were porous very fairly nicely, assembled together and form this nice two-dimensional film. So once again, in a morphological way, a 2D material which formed a 0D uh, modulator or morphology eventually ended into a 2D thin film morphology. So you could imagine that this particular case, these materials, how nicely they assemble. And these 2D thin films are you know, even more porous than the nanospheres itself. I mean, their porosity goes up to almost up to 2000 meters square per gram in the laboratory. I'm sure you, you will be able to do even better if you try it in all that. So we did a, a study of the powder diffraction data. We found out that the thin films do, because of the preferred, preferred orientation, have a much more sharper uh, Bragg's reflection compared to the nanospheres, which is obvious. And also the thin films, because the pores are now connected to each other, more accessible to each other. And as a result, the surface area or the porosity is far more twi uh, double or sometimes even triple, triple compared to the nanospherical counterpart. Please make a note that both the nanospheres and the films are the same material, same corp with the same molecular level or uh, two I mean molecular level organization. If you wish, and, and in our laboratory, we went, uh, went ahead and did a bunch of synthesis and made this nanosphere a bulk, uh, a significant variety of those. And here I'm showing a few varieties for your ready reference. And these nanospheres are, are very nicely organized and then form the thin film of your choice. We monitored that uh, with respect to, uh, respect to the DLA study. And as I told you that initially they were about 50 to 100 nanometers slowly as time progresses, they assemble together and eventually they form this beautiful, beautiful architecture or beautiful two dimensional architecture. The chemistry is still a bit elusive to us. And though I'm uh, saying over here that all these as amine and aldehyde that uh, reacts together and slowly start forming their amine and LDL or imine bond on the surface or uh, sort of the uh, more and more coughs start forming on the surface or the, in the joints. And eventually that uh, gives you this two dimensional film. And we monitored it with respect to the IR that the amine peak starts disappearing from the nanosphere. Please note that the nanospheres do have the free amines on the surface. So you see in the IR the amine peaks which slowly start disappearing and eventually very tiny amount will remain. But that we believe is not the key, not the key here. And more research is required because we are getting some more data where we can actually, uh, we need to module this, uh, this information. But for the time being, please take a look at this. This spheres assemble, forms the cough in the interlayer, which sort of occupies and, and eventually give you these two dimensional films at, at choice. As I said, uh, I'm sure you are thinking, what do we do with all these things? You can coat these films very nicely because they are solution processable now. You could coat them uh, very nicely on alumina, nylon, or other hollow, or hollow, hollow fiber membrane. And you could use, and we are trying to co uh, collaborate with my colleague at Central Salt and Medin Research Institute to see if this can be done for arsenic and uh, desalination process. All right. Now in the, my uh, final part of my talk, and I would like to show you another variety. So now you could see from 
nanospheres, we could make these uh, nanosheets, we could make the nanospheres, and from there we could make these films. So I will show you one another example where we, we uh, took this one step ahead and we used this uh, bilayer technique or bilayer uh, method where we could use this bilayer and uh, in the bottom layer we had the aldehyde and the top layer we had damine and it worked exactly like the way uh, interfacial polymerization happens which is a very very vast and open field where you have one ingredient on the bottom another ingredient on the another layer two different layers and then in the interfacial you grow the polymer in the same way we could also crystallize these cough materials interfacially in this these are please mind it these are all self-standing films they're not on any support whatsoever and these cases which i like to highlight to you that these self-standing films not only you could make a diverse variety of it, but these particular self-standing films are once again equally crystalline and equally porous. Of course, needless to say, they're not as porous or as crystalline like the bulk or the large size crystalline particles, because please understand that they have a finite dimension and also a preferred orientation as well. But what we could find that in all the cases, you could module the growth of the layers whatever layer you wish, I mean, how far you want to make it thick, you could do that. Once again, due to the self-standing nature of it, we could, we needed to uh, uh, grow, let's say from 100 nanometer onwards, but if you would like to rest it on a, on a support, then you probably can go even, even lower. Here, that the thing I would like to point out, now please take a look at it, how the formation happens. Once again, the nanoparticles are now not nano, they are like one dimensional fibers, as I have told you, and these fibers assembled together in the interface, unlike the previous case where the spheres assembled together to form the thin films. So from the 0D, you are getting 2D, and also from the 1D structure, also you are getting 2D. So you could see how these morphology modulations are, are so facile, and you could monitor their, monitor their, uh, their formation because, because these materials are these are self-standing films, you could lift it up and you could utilize and monitor it up. We, we made it very thick, if we wish, uh, because we wanted to see how far we can go. We could make up to around five micron uh, thickness and we could take these self-standing films uh, and just did simple molecular sieving. We expected it should work because the pores are nicely, fairly nicely aligned. Please note that the crystallites are organized together, but the pores are fairly nicely aligned and uh, this, they do uh, a very nice molecular sieving uh, mechanism. And we could uh, do a very nice molecular sieving. Once again, I would like to mention that because of the self-standing nature, we had to take a thicker membrane uh, beyond five, I mean, uh, about two micron in, in dimension. If you wish, you can even go higher up and you can make it thicker and thicker and thicker, these membranes, and then they will become even flexible, you know, you know which is, and there is absolutely no binder or anything whatsoever. These layers are just interdigitated like this, so that if you give a mild amount of shear, they will still do this bending or uh, they will have this flexibility, though there are, aren't any binder. The porosity will keep on increasing if you make it thicker and thicker. I think it is pretty obvious, as you can see, at the surface area we are hitting now almost to 14 to 1500. And US, you can utilize these materials for molecular saving, which we have been doing for last about two to three years. And the focus now has shifted a little bit towards, mainly towards the desalination and arsenic, rather than just uh, doing a simple separation of bulkier uh, agents, because it is very obvious to see that these bulkier agents will not, will not come through. They do get absorbed on one surface of the pore, but if you do a back flush, they will come. So that's pretty much what I wanted to discuss and I shall uh, now finish off my presentation with uh, one a simple example that these materials and as I told you that these materials whatever uh, we have designed not only 2D, 0D you could make, you could also make a 3D structure where you use the same PTSA based synthesis but just add a little bit of uh, sodium bicarbonate to give a boost of carbon dioxide during the synthesis and you can take these fibers uh, two-dimensional uh, nano sheets and you could eventually make this very nice 3D architecture which is a combination of all these 
all these uh, all these different morphologies. So this is basically I wanted to say, and these morphologies, when you make it in 3D, they will showcase a very nice you know, static adsorption. I would say that you know they adsorb very fast. All the most of the pollutants, whatever we have put in, to be very honest, most of the reagents, whatever we put in, any dye or any other pollutants which can interact with the backbone because of it is now a crystalline thread which is, uh, which is organized in amorphous manner. So eventually the threads are all crystalline, but overall structure is amorphous in, in nature. So I will skip this part, but if you wish, we can even, you can even make a 3D printing of it and, uh, and uh, even do, even go to, let's put it in this way, micro scale to meso scale to even macro scale. So you can achieve a porosity. Over here, you can see it is a microporous material, formed the mesoscale structure, eventually gave a two nanometer a grid, uh, I'm sorry, two centimeter grid, two centimeter by two centimeter grid. So some of these aspects, you know, a starting point of uh, Professor Yagi's uh, this uh, pioneering research in 2005. And uh, we have uh, summarized some of these aspects of the, of the bulk scale synthesis, morphology modulation, and so on and so forth in this particular perspective. If you are interested, you are welcome to take a look at it. So overall, I thought I could give you some overview that you could even go one step ahead and uh, do a lot of modulation in morphologies should you wish to do that because these materials are sort of alive or sort of live-like. Uh, so this could be utilized at purpose. I'd like to acknowledge my students. Uh, I have a very small group at ISA Kolkata because I moved in here a couple of years ago. All my collaborators, collaborators Thomas Heine, long-term collaborator, and the Natu Edicott, Ulas uh, Karul, and David Doto are deeply acknowledged. All the funding agencies are deeply acknowledged as well. And once again, thank you, Stefan, and all our colleagues who have put tireless effort to organize this beautiful conference. Truly, thanks from my, from my heart. Thank you so very much.